Hi, everybody. And Jen. Hi. It's Freda and Hawk. Hi. Hi, Hi there. Um, <clears throat> let me hand it over to Freda. Have a great time, everybody. Thanks, Jen. Here we are <laughs> We're back again with another great episode of Behind the Book with Hawk Hotch. Um, for our new viewers, welcome. If you want to be on uh, the list to hear about everything that's coming up, please send us an email at behindthebook.com at mptf, no, behindthebook at mptf.com, and we'll get back to you. Uh, I'm particularly delighted about today's episode because two of my favorite women are involved and another new friend. Um, one of them uh, is my son's godmother, and I hope that she will be uh, bringing Tessie's wisdom to all the conversations they have in the future. Um, and what is really the, one of the best parts of this program is Hawk Hotch. And I'm always happy to say over to you. Well, thanks, Freda. And thank you for organizing and doing all you do for this and for the fund itself. Thanks, Hawk. Uh, and good afternoon and welcome to what I know will be a, a very enjoyable uh, uh, hour and a half. Uh, we're going to do the behind the book a little differently today, as opposed to me just interviewing uh, Joy Horowitz. Uh, we're going to be doing a, uh, or not me, but they're going to be doing a um, staged reading of portions of Joy's book. Her book is called Tessie and Pearlie, a granddaughter's story. And it's basically uh, Joy's idea to interview her grandmothers while they were still alive. Joy, so you know, uh, graduated only uh, cum laude from Harvard, sorry, then got a master's at Yale. I don't know how Harvard and Yale, well, I don't know. <coughs> I know they're comp competitors. Joy was an investigative and environmental journalist and a nominee for a Pulitzer Prize for an article she did for the LA Times. This is her second book, and I just want to say, welcome, Joy. Where is she? I know she's going to come on right about. Hi, there I'm she here. Is. here. Hi, Hawk. There's Joy. Hi, Hi. Joy. Hi, how, Hi. You, how are you and your family doing with COVID? How's it going? You okay? Well, yes. You know, it's like my grandmothers would say, with one tushy, you can't dance at two weddings, meaning we have to prioritize and figure out what's important. And I feel like that's what this pandemic has done to everybody. It's we have sort of figured out the meaning, which is that we're very grateful to be here and feeling very lucky that we're healthy and okay. And thank you for asking. Well, good. And uh, I've read your book if for everybody, uh, aside from what we're going to talk about in the book, there's also uh, because it's the high holy days coming up for the Jewish, those of us who may be Jewish, uh, there, are, there are recipes for matzah brai, uh, chicken soup, marble cake, and of course, the old Jewish French toast. So aside from everything else, if you wanna learn how to cook that stuff, you better get on Kindle or something and read it before Friday's Rosh Hashanah meal. Yes. Any rate, so. Thank you for the Let's, plug. And the recipes are great, by the way, because yeah, they are. grandmothers, they're speaking the recipe. So there's nothing like, you know, listening to a bubby relay her recipe that way. So now I understand the book started just as an, you, you write a lot for the LA Times and you wrote, actually you wrote an article uh, that really was very powerful, or was it a book? Of, it was a book about uh, Beverly Hills High School and the oil well and how so many students had been getting cancer. So yeah. she, she, Joy is well known throughout the country and especially in LA. And she started this LA Times article to talk about, and, uh, and she wanted to interview her grand, grandmother. So how did the book come about and what, how did this all start? Well, so I had a great editor at the Los Angeles Times named Susan Brenneman, and she had me write a story about my bubbies 
And what she did, which was great, was put them on the cover of the magazine. So they became cover girls. And because of that, <laughs> the response to the piece was incredible. I mean, it was like every writer's dream of tons of letters of appreciation about these two women. And so because of that, uh, there was a publisher in New York who was interested and offered me the chance to write a book. Wow. Yeah. Now because we can't do the whole book in, in our time together. Can you right. kind of give us a little background of where both, uh, where they were born and how they got to America or what happened with them? Because I think that that context will be helpful for us yeah, as we, sure. we hear them. So Tessie was born in 1901 in Kosovo, shtetl that was in Galicia, which is now Ukraine, which was then Austria, Poland, uh, very close to the Russian border. And um, she was one of seven children and they had to flee uh, during World War I. So they crossed the Carpathian Mountains by horse and wagon. Um, and when they got back two years later, uh, her entire house had been destroyed by her neighbors. So um, her dad had run a, um, an oil, a, a cotton seed oil company and a brick factory. And so Pe uh, Tessie, one of the things that she did as a teenager was to teach the workers how to extract the oil from the cotton seed. And so if you met her when she was in her 90s, she had the most beautiful hands you've ever seen, supposedly because she kept dipping her hands in oil as a little kid. Um, but anyway, she um, was incredibly smart and she knew how to help her family. She, she had to uh, work the black market when she was 15. She got typhoid fever, lost her hair, put a shmata on her head and went out and sort of uh, exchanged the oil that her family uh, uh, sold for um, goods on the black market. And then her family came to the United States in, or she came in 1920, right before women were granted the right to vote. And um, her brother, Frank, had died two years earlier in the pandemic in 1918. So, um, but Tessie um, started a mom and pop grocery store uh, with this guy named Izzy Horowitz, who she married, and uh, she lived up to the name, the meaning of the name Horowitz, which is supposedly works hard. And uh, Pearlie was born in the United States on the Lower East Side, and um, she too was one of seven children, but um, sadly, three of her siblings died. She had two baby brothers who died and a 13-year-old sister who died of a weak heart. And um, her dad was a presser of women's coats and her mom ran a series of dry goods stores and candy stores. And um, Pearlie started working um, sewing labels into coats for five bucks a week. And um, she was advised to, she needed a winter coat and she was advised to go see this guy, Morris Feldman. And he sort of specialized in making coats for women, heavy set women. So uh, she met Mo, her, who would become her husband, and fell instantly in love with him. And um, they lived in mostly uh, Brooklyn, far Rockaway. So um, yeah, one was, one was living in Europe, the other was living in New York, or was born there, and then Tessie came from Europe to New York. There was one piece early in the book that I remember so well talking about Tessie and her family in their house, the the shooting between the the allies and the and the axis were going on right between their house and they were literally from both sides and yeah yeah she was like dodged. literally dodging the bullets yeah, yeah. yes mm -hmm. unbelievable mm -hmm. i think you 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 learn a lot <laughs> if you're able to make it through that that's quite an experience and both of your of your grandmothers never got beyond seventh grade because as you said they had to they had to work and right. yet you said of all the women you've met and you've met a lot of women in your life right. uh, they were the they were the smartest why do you say that 
Well, you know, they weren't book smart because they had to uh, leave school early, but they were, uh, there's a lot that's been made lately about emotional intelligence uh, as being like the sort of critical component for success in life, namely uh, resilience and the ability to um, read other people well, and um, and that was that was Tessie and Pearlie. I mean, Tessie's ability to read what was going on was really evident. She was an incredible poker player, and she could read what people were, you know, what what their cards were without knowing. And Pearlie, her particular brand of genius that way was she was a remarkable matchmaker. Uh, she fixed up uh, both of her daughters, if you can believe it. Uh, and so, I mean, how many mothers can claim to do that? That's pretty amazing. And they stayed opinion. married to whoever she picked them up? Yeah, yeah. Up. She fixed up my father. She sent a batch of chocolate chip cookies and a very fetching picture of my mother when she was 16, like in this very cute little bikini. And she sent it to her son, Jerry, who was for like maybe one of his army buddies might be a match for my mom. And so my father saw this picture of this gorgeous girl and said, yeah, and the rest is history. And then she did the same with my, her other daughter, Dee Dee. Dee Dee was, um, uh, or, or Tessie, or excuse me, Pearlie had gone to her uh, doctor, her eye doctor. And the guy who was working at the front desk, she thought might be a good match for her daughter. And in fact, they've stayed married for 50 years. Wait a minute. Did I hear you say that your mother was in a bikini in the 1920s? Well, okay, wait, no. Uh, it wasn't a bikini. It was sort of like a long term. In fact, you guys have a picture of it. So when Jen puts it up, you'll be able to see it. It's sort of like one of these candy striper two piece numbers, you know. Okay, okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, well, um, I understand. Uh, now, there are there different themes. Oh, there she is. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's a hot picture. Right? I can that's, that's Shirley at the beach. She, my mother loved the beach. And this was the picture that was enough for my dad to fall in love with her and go, whoa, I got to meet her. And by the way, I have to say the same thing happened with my sister, I had a picture of my sister looking gorgeous on my refrigerator and my brother-in-law saw it and said, who is that woman? I'm going to marry her. And he did. Wow. Mm -hmm. It's, it's in your blood. It's, uh, <laughs> it's in the Horowitz blood. They work hard and they find the right, the right mates. We are matchmakers. It is true. Sounds terrific. Yeah. Now, there are different themes that run through your book about family secrets. Oh. Uh, can you talk about any of yours? Well, I mean, you know, the main one in the book is uh, in those days, it was sort of about, you know, cancer wasn't really discussed, uh, the big C. And my dad, who was a psychologist, had a thriving practice, and he did not want uh, his patients to know that he was ill. So, and he also didn't want um, his mother to know that he was ill. So I, as the middle child, of course, was going back and forth between my folks in Beverly Hills and my grandmother as I was interviewing her in New York and basically trying to keep the secret of his illness. But she's a very smart woman and she could hear in his voice that something was up. And she kept asking me. So there were scenes in the book, you know, where she was sort of prying me for information about how sick he actually was. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, they're again in the book you find that they're very, very different, Tessie and Pearlie. Yeah, Can yeah. You, uh, one, rather than me, you tell me how different. Give me a quick personality trait of both of them that are so opposite each other, and yet they got along. Well, you know, Jerry, we're gonna we're gonna do a reading, and you're gonna see for your, when you meet Tessie and Pearlie in this reading, they they will let you know themselves about how different they really are. Okay, well then okay. that's enough of me. I'm gonna get out, and I'm gonna let you introduce your wonderful actresses, and I hope all of you enjoy the reading, and we'll be back. Uh, if you have questions during the reading, you can hit a chat, and when the reading's over, we will uh, we will try and answer all your questions. So, go to a joy and have a great time.
Thank you so much, Hawk. I really appreciate it. I'm really happy to be here. Um, okay, so first, I'm going to introduce you to my nice. friend and neighbor, Jesse Nathan, uh, who has appeared in a lot of TV shows. Hi, Jesse. Um, including Kojak and Rockford Files, and she was also a series regular on Soap. And she's also a wonderful writer and an artist, and she's a grandmother to Jude, Milo, Tallulah, and Felix, right? Right. right. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. And you. I'd also like to introduce you to my friend Kate Zental, and she's going to be playing Tessie today. She's an artist in residence. Hi, Katie, with uh, Jewish Women's Theater and has appeared in a bunch of movies and commercials and TV, including Hunter, Cheers, Lou Grant, one of my favorite. It's a Living, Becker, LA Law. And she's also a writer and editor for magazines, books, blogs, and websites. And as a new grandmother to baby Gracie, she reflects that all of the above take their place behind this awesome, blessed event. So um, are we ready, ladies? Mm -hmm. OK, so I would like to um, dedicate this reading today to my granddaughter, 20-month-old uh, beautiful Lou James. OK, here we go. Compared to my grandmothers, I'm a shmagegi. That's shmagegi, Yiddish for nerd or ineffectual slob. They, of course, would fiercely deny that their granddaughter is a nudnik. How could I be anything but brilliant and beautiful in their eyes? Perfect, even. But the truth is that next to them, I'm a regular schmo. Take Chin Rummy, for instance. The last time I played Tessie, my father's mother, she killed me, 98 to nothing. She knew she would. When I asked her to play, she replied without malice. Vi, you want to see how you can lose? <laughs> As for my mother's mother, Pearly, her particular genius resides in a ball of yarn and a crochet needle. You need a toilet paper cover, a doll with braids, a placemat, an afghan, a beret. You name it, Pearl makes it. She shouldn't because of her arthritis, but sometimes a yarn maker can't help herself and sneaks in a baby sweater for her great-granddaughter packaged inside a knotted plastic bag. She's so beautiful. Kanahara. I am pathetic and bring Pearly nothing. It's nothing, darling. My grandmothers are the strongest women I know. True, their health is fading, but in my mind, they're pioneers and adventurers, brave and fearless. Starkers, to be precise. Tessie Weinrib lives by herself in Queens, New York, by way of the old country, namely Galicia in Austria's Carpathian Mountains, and Pearlie Feldman in Santa Monica, California, by way of the Lower East Side and Brooklyn. They're also the first women that I've watched grow old, outliving between them 12 siblings, three husbands, one son, and most of their friends. Pearlie is 94. Tessie turns 95 this year. Maybe God forgot my address. Always with the jokes. They can get on my nerves. They especially drive me crazy with their old world superstitions and Neanderthal attitudes about a range of issues. And yet, they're my gurus. Just as striking as their longevity is the sense of utter constancy they offer in a world that seems to speed along faster and faster. Like it or not, they are my personal guides into old age and the existential dilemma. You shrink. That's much you should know. You shrivel up just like a potato. Two matriarchs, they are my bubbies. Yiddish for grandmother. They're not the least pretentious, nothing fancy schmancy about them, and they offer no sugar-coated prescriptions for life. It is hard, it is complicated, it is not forever. There is joy and sorrow and sorrow and joy. Always there is family and passion. Even now, the titles of their favorite TV shows speak volumes. Tessie's is... The Young and the Restless. And Pearlie's is... Mad About You. <laughs> the last of a breed, they are still close to their immigrant past, hardened by wars and um, the Great Depression and shaped by discrimination against Jews that began to dissipate only in the 1950s. 
Now they have little patience for basic questions. What is, is. Ask Tessie, for instance, why being an Orthodox Jew is so important to her, and she answers rhetorically. Why does an Arab wear the shmata on his head? Ask Pearl why she continues wearing her wedding band 18 years after her husband's death, and she says, I'm married forever to him, all my life. I'm a Jewish nun. I first decided to interview my grandmas when I realized they were having a difficult time recuperating from falls they had both suffered in the summer of 1993. Both had slipped and broken their arms. Pearlie's stumble was especially traumatic since it occurred when she was two-stepping with her folk dance troupe, the Dancing Dolls, during the rousing finale of Achy Breaky Hot. I phoned them both to say that I wanted to write an article about them. Oh, Vajmir, can't you get a better subject? I can't see, I can't hear, I can't talk. What else? Translation, she couldn't wait to see me. <laughs> Curly was equally happy to comply. Doyle, my life is an open book. You just tell me when. So for the next year and a half, I alternated between interviewing them. Tessie in Queens in her apartment decorated Neo I Love Lucy with furnishings from the 1950s and Pearlie in her tiny one bedroom in Santa Monica. At first glance, Tessie and Pearlie seem as different as two women could be. Tessie boycotted my wedding when I married my husband Brock, who is not Jewish. Pearlie not only came to our wedding just a month after her husband died, but she also joyously danced there a la Isadora Duncan in pink chiffon. Tessie strictly observes Jewish ritual, keeping kosher and attending shul as often as possible. Pearlie, who prays by writing letters to her deceased son and husband, believes that religion resides in the heart. On closer inspection, though, it, it quickly becomes clear that my grandmothers both face the same predicament. Both women, in a sense, have become invisible. As with the matriarchs of the Old Testament, you have to read between the lines to understand them, or just to find them. To be an old woman in American culture is to be cast off, dismissed as daft or ugly or worse. Jewish mothers in particular have become cultural icons in the butt of countless jokes. Yet these public portrayals mask a deeper truth that is no secret. Women outlive men. Thus, their undisputed power resides in their longevity as keepers of the family legacy. Tessie and Pearlie stand as symbols. Sometimes there are men around and sometimes not, but life goes on either way. What matters to me anyway is that I find the girl and the woman before me still alive with possibility. What is your favorite health tip or, or beauty or fitness tip? Beautiful, I was never. I'd rather go for health than beauty, but I can't control my health anymore. I like to be clean, neat. Fancy? Mm -mm, no. Of course, I have my hair done and my nails done every Saturday at Danny's. I'd rather look decent so that people wouldn't say, that old lady, she looks like such a schlump. As for health, I just ate some potatoes. When I look in the mirror, I'm not happy to see the wrinkles. The skin changes so much in your 90s. The whole face changes. I don't know how to stop it. I, I, I just don't want to get to look any worse than I am now. <laughs> because I don't want to look scary to my grandchildren. And it's bound to happen. Your face becomes crepey. Your eyes become smaller. Your nose, it becomes longer. I, I put on sunscreen when I go out, uh, this little powder, lipstick. I can't pluck my eyebrows because the skin gets red and sore. They do the best they can. I brush my hair, I wash it. Otherwise, no secrets. <laughs> I never was one to stay in the beauty parlor. <laughs> as long as I take a shower twice a day, I keep myself clean, not to be stunk, smelly. The word that best describes Tessie is... Not a blabbermouth. My children would say critical. 
the word that best describes Pearly is love. How do you like to celebrate your birthday? Uh, no vicious, no schmicious. That's all. I don't tell anybody it's my birthday. What's the difference? The years that come, I don't appreciate it. I can't do what I want. Kate, I think you uh, you muted by mistake. Let's go back a beat. How far should how far back should I go? Just just this last thing. No wishes, no smishes. No wishes, no smishes. That's all. I don't tell anybody it's my birthday. What's the difference? Those years that come, I don't appreciate it. I can't do what I want. I don't enjoy with the old age. To me, I'm not that thrilled about it. I'm living the longest of anyone in my family. So, pish posh. How do you like to celebrate your birthday, Grandma Pearly? To be with family. Oh, yeah. Can you love your children too much? There's no such thing as to love children too much. No, it's not possible. Or is it? When you give love, you give it with your whole being. I don't think I could love my children less, no matter what. The door to Pearlie's apartment has a little plastic sign hanging from the doorknob, like the ones you leave out for room service in a hotel. But Pearlie's sign is a daily reminder of what it's like to live in the shadow of death. Good morning, I'm okay. Pearl has high cheekbones, bright eyes, and a pixie haircut, like Peter Pan. I practically tower over her now. She's such a sliver of her former self. You want orange juice or what? She lives five minutes away from me at the Silvercrest, a concrete apartment complex for seniors. Her building is sandwiched between a muffler shop and Fred Siegel's. During the week, she usually eats her meals downstairs in the dining hall. Otherwise, she cooks for herself in her tiny kitchen, unable to duplicate the lavish spread she's famous for in the family. But on the kitchen table, there's an entire plate of chocolate chip cupcakes she baked fresh for my visit. They're no cholesterol cupcakes. Did you make them from scratch? Yeah. Really? And there's no cholesterol. And where's the recipe from? From the box. And they come out perfect. They're so easy. Yeah, you take them right out of the, the, the thing. The thing. She means the paper cupcake wrapper. Her usual sartorial splendor is much in evidence. She wears a peach and white sweater with matching polyester pants and white Reeboks. She made the sweater not long ago and it has a gold thread embellishment. Around her neck, she wears a gold charm that says, happy birthday, a gift from her grandchildren for her 90th. You gotta enjoy your life. Don't rush, rush, rush. Learn to enjoy while you have your health. Though she slowed down recently, having stopped her volunteer work at the local hospital and cut her weekly dancing with the dolls for fear of another fall, Pearlie's great enthusiasm for life is undeterred by age. I think if you keep yourself involved in a lot of things, you don't concentrate on yourself, it helps a lot. It's good to have outside interests, to keep your mind busy. It's like a sore in your heart not to be involved. Life is great. If we could only have it without pain. What's, what's bad with life? It can be lots of fun in this world. Lots of enjoyment. Air to breathe. Food to eat. Places to go. Why do we know what we have in the other world? Nothing. Her mind is razor sharp, especially when I ask about her past. She conjures up vivid memories of having her tonsils extracted. Just yanked it out with like pliers. But then I got to get ice cream with my father on the trolley. And what about going through menopause? Uh, the doctor said to me, just lie down, put a cold compress to your head, your chest, relax. And I didn't have any problems. It didn't last too long, about two years. 
I survey her tiny apartment decorated with recycled furniture from my parents' house, including the vanity table from my bedroom when I was a little girl. Over the peephole to her door, she's hung a macrame object in little purple pom-poms. That's a, that's a schmitchik, a schmitchki, you know, a thing. If you, if you want a hand, you say, yeah, give me that schmitchki. Grandpa used to call this a schmitchkla. <laughs> the schmitchik can be any part of your body. It's a, like a whatchamacallit. Clearly, she was mad about Mo, my lusty grandfather, who would give me rides on his feet and make his biceps dance to the strains of Russian folk songs. She invokes his memory, his joie de vivre, whenever possible. When my younger sister recently reported how wonderful, kind, and supportive her new husband is, Pearlie asked only one question, Alamo. Is he a good lover? Mother's Day, 6.30 a.m., inside Tessie's apartment. Come, Mama Shana. Come eat breakfast. Leary-eyed, I've just arrived on the red eye from L.A. to her one-bedroom apartment in Queens. She lives in a six-story brick building, the Winston, in a tree-lined working-class neighborhood of Briarwood, not far from Forest Hills. In anticipation of my arrival, she's already beaten the eggs for my matzo bride, scrambled eggs with moistened matzo. Wrapped in a plastic bag and covered with a paper towel is her homemade marble cake, my favorite. At 93, Tessie stands just under five feet, though she once was a couple of inches taller. She wears thick pink frame glasses, red lipstick, a flowered house dress, and sneakers. Her right hand shakes, her fingers are gnarled from arthritis, her sciatica is a source of constant pain. Still, she manages to have her fingernails painted fire engine red. It's good to live long, but it's not good to get old. You can't do what you want. She sets a cup of coffee on the placemat for me. Do you use sugar or do you use your disposition? It's drizzling out. I ask about her arthritis. Ah, they wouldn't let me alone. Who wouldn't let you alone? The arthritis, they stick to me. They like me. A joke, Nick, she deflects most questions with her highly idiosyncratic brand of humor. I offer her a Mother's Day gift, a box of soaps. Why spent money on me? Why not? Because I hope I use it up. Meaning she doesn't think she'll live so long. Nah, I hope not. You hope not? Uh, because me no like it. She invokes the upside down syntax to a favorite old Yiddish song, Oi, I like she. To listen to someone you love tell you that she'd prefer to be dead is dreadful. In my grandmother's case though, it's predictable. She's been talking this way without remorse or rancor for the last several years at least. But her depression is also understandable. I lost confidence in myself. I don't trust myself anywhere. I don't go down to the mail myself. I, mean, I do sometimes, but the cane, I hate people should see me. So I don't go some places I wanna go. She ventures out twice a week now to her Golden Age Club on Mondays and to Danny's Beauty Salon on Saturdays to have her white hair fluffed and sprayed into a bubble-like crown. Now, anything I wanna do, I can't do for myself. It takes her half an hour to fasten her bra, longer to clean a chicken. So what is it? I don't want to aggravate the man upstairs, but it's no use. Maybe I'm too critical on myself, too. The kids say I'm too critical. Do you find me that way? No, not at the moment. She's just served me a giant slice of cake for breakfast. Who am I to complain? Minutes later though, I'm fair game. For this trip, I've lugged along a breast pump so that I can continue to nurse my 10 month old daughter when I return home. Tessie disapproves of the setup. If she could do the four days without you, you don't need it. I disagree. All right. Nice until her wedding day. For Tessie, it's a virtue to never reveal one's true feelings, especially sadness. When asked how she dealt with her grief, she says, I never made any sour face to anybody. Nobody knew what's inside of me. They still don't. 
I'm talking now, but I shouldn't. Why not? <laughs> Shut up! Now she's yelling at the TV set. Her soap opera, The Young and the Restless, is on, and she's bored by one of the plot lines. She likes to watch this show for the blind character, who she claims has never blinked, a sign to Tessie of fine acting ability. But more, she's interested in the trial of a woman who's been charged with killing her husband. If she'd had the opportunity, my grandma tells me, she would have been a lawyer, or better still, a writer. She's never admitted this girlhood fantasy to me before. With my pen and notebook in hand, I search her milky gray eyes and feel my shoulders lighten. The flash of connection, a flesh and blood link of desire spanning three generations. Not that she says anymore, she doesn't need to. She sits in a recliner chair with a blue embroidered cloth draped over the headrest. Ugh, here's the cockamercial again. A bubby survey on motherhood. How do you let go of your children? Oh, it's very hard. It's one of the hardest things in the whole world. It's so hard. I can't even tell you, Joy. I remember when your mother went on her honeymoon with your grandfather and with your father and your grandfather, Izzy, called me up and he said, is Mike there? Are uh, the children there? I wanted to wish them well. And uh, I said, no. And I started to cry. I just can't tell you how I cried. Uh, but it's very hard to let go of your children. Even when you took them to school on the first day, didn't you feel sad about that? I mean, anytime you have to part from your children, it's very hard, very hard. And it doesn't get easier. Instead of getting easy, it gets harder. Isn't that strange? How do you let go? You'll be happy to get rid of them. <laughs> but I mean, in a good way. You feel that they're on their own. They're, you've done your job. You've missed them, of course, but that's all. You get so used to it. In some part of you, you get used to it. It hurts and it hurts. And you get used to the pain. The phone rings. Bad news. My mother has just learned she has breast cancer. Now she's calling to tell me that she's opted for a mastectomy deciding that the radiation treatments that accompany lumpectomy are too risky. The phone rings again, it's pearly, her voice shaky, bordering on hysterical. She asks for my permission to call my mother even though she's just spoken to her. She's made the same call to my older sister, Sherry. I don't wanna be a bother. I, I, I hesitate 10 times before I call. I don't wanna be a nudge. You, you see, when your children are babies, you learn to protect them no matter how old they are. And they're always your children and they're still your babies. And uh, the, the, the feeling never leaves you. I know, I'm a pain in the ass. Please forgive me, Joyla, but uh, she's my baby, my baby. Why can't it be me, not her? When I hear my grandmother, fragile, frightened, nervous, wanting to help but knowing she can do nothing, I hear myself and I cannot bear to listen. In the weeks that follow while my mother's recuperating from surgery, I speak to Pearlie more often than usual. Normally we talk on the phone weekly and see each other about twice a month for family gatherings, brunches, birthday parties. And invariably she ushers me home with another batch of French toast for my kids. My mother's cancer brings me closer to my grandmother who tells me that her greatest wish in life is that her daughter be well. For the time being anyway, her wish has come true. In June, Pearlie, my mother, my daughter Lucy, and I watch my middle kid, Gus, perform a little show at the Odyssey Theater, a four-generation cheering section. Afterward, Pearlie hands me an envelope to deliver to Gus. In it, she's enclosed $15 in cash and a note telling him how much she loves him. Then, in the quiet of her living room, she writes a letter to her son, Jerry, who's been dead for 20 years. Dear Gerala, it is with a lighter heart I'm reading, I'm, I'm, I'm writing to you today. Uh, thank God Shirley is feeling better. I know your prayers for her recovery help, Gerala. Today is Father's Day, and I know how your family misses you. They are all such good children. And I know how much you will be missed, as they know how much you are missed 
Dobo. Thanks again for your prayers. Always, your mom. I wonder, how is it that someone who grew up with so little can give so much? Just how Pearlie managed to live this long is a question she's often asked since she's outlived nearly everyone at the Silvercrest. You got to listen to your body. Like even if you get a corn, you soak your feet. There are some dietary concessions, including the non-cholesterol cupcakes, but truth be told, she's a big proponent of butter or an occasional glass of wine and of gargling with Sepacol at the first sign of a sore throat. And exercise is important, of course. She walks to the Third Street Promenade daily, jogs in place in her apartment, and takes an exercise class for her arthritis twice a week. I really think that as long as you can move, you should keep on moving. Because when you sit, everything sits with you. When you hit 92 especially, the body sort of lets you know, ah, you're getting old. Take it easy. We're tired of taking care of you, the bones. Most recently, she's realized that her taste buds have stopped working. But back to the longevity question. Oh, I think it's the family that makes me live this long nine grandchildren, 13 great-grandchildren. There's so much enjoyment in this. I couldn't ask for anything more. No money, no jewelry, no anything could compete with the wonderful family that I have. I say thank you to God for letting me live this long. And anything he gives me over that, I thank him again twice. But I wanna tell you something. If you're a good person, when you're young, you're a good Pison when you're old. And if you're a nasty Pison when you're young, you're a nasty Pison when you're old. Character doesn't change. Age doesn't change character. What does Tessie think of Pearlie and Pearlie think of Tessie? I like her very much. I admire her very much. She's a different type from me. I grew up in Europe, she grew up in America. I don't know which way is better or worse. Tessie? She's a, she's a good person, a, a very interesting woman. She has a different attitude about life. Uh, she's looking forward to death. She figures it would be a relief. I don't figure that. I want to last as long as I can. I want to be on this earth. She says it would be great if she died in her sleep. But life is so, it's so interesting, you know? Are you a feminist? Say it in plain English. Why do you mean a feminist? Do you believe in equal rights for women? Definitely. Women need to work and be equal, but also, not to hurt yourself. Yes, that I would like. I wouldn't mind that at all. A woman should have the same rights as a man. I wouldn't let my husband go above me. If he drives, I drive too. My father always told us, don't look up. There's no end to up. Look down. There are those who haven't got but to eat. That's how he kept us humble. It is, of course, one of the basic tenets of the story of Moses, humility. Even now, she views her life in much the same way. When she washes her dishes, she must lean her elbows against the sink counter for support. When she coughs, her whole body shakes with the force of a gale wind. When she walks, her slipper-clad feet shuffle against the yellow and orange linoleum tile floor, unsteady and slow. Ask her how she feels, and she replies, Ah, oh, Miss Schlepser. I drag myself. I have a friend at Rockaway Beach and she says to me, Tesla, other people would like to schlep and they can't. Thank God you can do it. Thank God you can schlep. And she's right. A bubby sex survey. Did your mother tell you about sex? Oh no. <laughs> she never discussed sex with me. She never discussed anything. You must be joking. <laughs> Did you enjoy sex? 
I certainly did. <laughs> but it was from love, you know? We would kiss and love, you know. Um, I attribute sex to the next thing after you kiss and you love. That's the next thing. It's like a sentence. You, you start a sentence, you think about it, you write a couple of words, you finish it. Same thing with this here with sex. Like you love somebody and then you finish your love by uh, having sex with them. Did you enjoy sex, Tessa Love? Of course. Yes. Why not? Who doesn't? I used to read a lot about it. Polish books, German books, love stories. The first book, it was German. Die Ashton Liebe, the first love. I knew more or less what's going on. I mean, but I didn't practice it. Not before I was married. Oh, I'll tell you something. When I got married, I didn't know you can do it without getting married. There was no such thing. But what is love, really? It's not when you go to bed. It's when you care for someone. When you, when you consider the next one a mensch. When was the last time you had sex, Pearlie? The last time I had sex, well, you know, um, even grandpa, when he was sick, his mind wasn't working, uh, we slept in one bed. And um, he wanted to have sex, and uh, we had sex. And, and then when he was in the nursing home, the hospital, I remember coming to see him and he asked me, uh, so politely, like a gentleman, he said to me, oh, I wanna have sex with you so badly. And I said, forget about it. And he was um, a very passionate man. And uh, it was always with the love and the kissing and uh, we worked up to passion. It, it was never, never just going to sex. There was always a lot of loving. <laughs> and uh, he always played the part that he wasn't interested. He didn't like it. Like it was only me that wanted it. Okay, he says, you want it? I see you want it. Okay, Pearly, he says. But it wasn't true. He really wanted it. Oh, my God. Who knows? Let's say uh, the early 50s, the last time. 40, 50 years. <laughs> so what? You can live without it. To me, sex, schmex doesn't mean a thing. If I had it, I enjoyed it. I thought you had to do it. You must. It's in the marriage license to please a husband, to please my husband. I did it. But I enjoyed it too, sure. Listen, I wouldn't have become pregnant three times, huh? How do you learn to live alone? You don't learn. You just take day by day and it comes and you accept it and you have no choice. And that's how you learn to live with it. Nobody's an expert. How do you learn to live alone, Pearlie? It's hard, but you do it. You, you sort of, you graduate into it. When I lost Mo, you get used to doing this on your own and uh, deciding things on your own. Uh, you, you use your head a little bit more. I think it comes naturally. Nature sort of helps you out. It guides you when you know you have to depend on yourself. It's up to you to keep on draying, turning the wheel. It makes you more independent. So you do what you have to do, darling. Both my grandmothers tell me the same thing. They can literally feel the life force leaving their bodies. It's a slow, inexorable, but distinct feeling that comes in your 90s. It's not that you're faint, no, but a, a feeling. It's so terrible that you're expiring. I start feeling like hot, and then I don't know anything. I sit there and I hold tight to the table. It takes only a few seconds. Not, not faint, but out. Uh, nothing, nothing, nothing. It's, it's just a, a weakened feeling, Joyla. It's very hard to describe. 
Of the two, Pearlie is most fearful of death. You know your time is limited, uh, but you don't want to know it. Uh, you don't want to think about it. It's so hard to come in face to face with it. I think you have to have a really good, strong character to be able to, to talk about it. I think you do have a really strong character. You do? I don't know. I don't know. The fear of what's going to happen to you is so, so tense. And yet, you know there must be an end to the life you live. You don't want to talk about it. It sort of depresses you. You want to think about lighter things. So she's taken to calling Tessie for death pep talks. I told her to just leave it go. Whatever will happen, will happen. What can you do? Just let it go. That's all. If you really look at it and face the truth, you can't be good looking and die. So what? A bubby poll on maternal instincts. What makes a good mother? <laughs> well, that, that's the $64,000 question. <laughs> she takes care of the children, doesn't talk dirty to them. Put the children on a pedestal. That's important. So you give a feeling of security to a child. Making a child feel that not just a small child, he's a person. He means a lot to the family. You gotta give the child a feeling of goodwill, responsibility. He belongs in the family. He's something in the family. And when you give that child an attachment, when they're small like that, it stays with them forever. It stays with them forever. By giving them affection, by listening to them. If they talk to you, don't cast them off and say, oh, okay, I'll see you later. Make it important. And they'll always be important to you. They'll feel like that. They'll have that feeling of security. What really annoys me about Tessie and Pearlie is the very thing that makes me adore them most. Their questioning, their resolute not knowingness. Even now in their 90s, they're still trying to figure things out, still asking questions about life's mysteries that can make you totally insane if you ask enough. Pearlie and Tessie, though, have the courage not to stop. Why do people have to suffer before they die? If I had what to say in this matter, I would make a law that people should live and exist as long as they can help themselves. I can go very hard, I can say what I want. Must people get very sick to die? Ah, there must be a reason. But if I would be God, I would make it different. Pearly also weighs in on that one. Ah, joy of life. Why? 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 She wants to know why my father's being stricken with cancer a third time. Like a window. I can see through it. Pearly said those words 25 years ago, right when I was weaning my daughter Lucy, who just started graduate school to become a psychologist like her grandpa, Mike, my father. It's just like Curly said. <sighs> Life is like a dream, my darling. Yeah, it is. Maybe the biggest irony of writing a book about my grandmothers was that I had written it for my mom. I intended it to be a sort of primer for her of growing old, what it means to be a starker in the world without a man. Like she'd need to read about that for me. But the day after my father's funeral, my mom learned that her breast cancer had recurred, and a year later, she died. Pearlie, I think, died of a broken heart. Children just aren't supposed to go before their parents. She was 97 when she was buried beside her beloved Moishala in Brooklyn. We threw Tessie a party on her 100th birthday at a kosher deli in Queens, and she died the following year at 101. Neither of my grandmothers had the opportunity to go to college, and that's where this story has a very happy ending. My publisher got a call from the librarian at the Schlesinger Library at Harvard. She wanted to buy a couple of copies of my Bubby book for the library. That means that my grandmothers are in good company now, 
along with Eleanor Roosevelt and the Archives of Julia Child and the National Organization for Women. Their voices live on in one of the world's most prestigious universities. Just think, as the distinguished academics return to Harvard this year, they'll be there with my grandmothers, whose wisdom and courage live on. My life and my fleet and my state who find art. Translation, you run and you stay in one place and you fly. That was terrific, ladies. Just, just terrific. I, I can't tell you. Uh, we've been rehearsing for three and a half weeks, and this was the best of the. No, no, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, you guys were all really good, and and it certainly uh, brought back. I know memories of my. I had one grandmother who was alive. So just thank you so much for doing this. We do have some questions and uh, I hope you'll all Great. stick around. Um, first, uh, Joy, when you, when you were interviewing them, I noticed you were, uh, you were always doing something else. You were playing gin rummy with Tessie. You were driving uh, pearly different places. What was, what was the thought process behind that? Well, first of all, I had only so much time in which to actually sit down and interview them. But, you know, honestly, the thing is, is that I, I, I teach at uh, journalism at USC at the Annenberg School. And one of the things I always teach my students is that when they're writing profiles of people, that the important thing is to, to do something while you're talking to them to get their minds off of the idea that they're talking to you. It just, it becomes more of a natural thing. So it was much easier for me and more fun, obviously, to be with Pearlie when she was on her conga line or with Tessie when she was, you know, bad mouthing the person next to her at the beauty shop, then it would have been just sitting in their apartments. Now, um, the misogyny that you write about in your family seems to extend from one generation to the next. And yet it seems to be a matriarchy where the women exert the most power in the family. Now, can you talk about that? Well, that's sort of the paradox of for me, of having grown up in the 50s and the 60s, where it's like, you know, father knows best and the men had control of everything. But on the home front, it was the women who were the caretakers and the cooks and the people who were really running what was going on. So, um, you know, over time, that certainly has changed dramatically in my family, thank God. But um, for when I was growing up, my mom was, um, you know, a homemaker. And um, I think it was only later in life that she talked to me about how she regretted that. Um, but, you know, all of these steps um, are incremental. So on the one hand, uh, for example, at Passover, when the women were required to wash the men's hands, um, but we're also running around, you know, making gefilte fish and everything else for everybody. Um, I think there was a certain amount of resentment about that. But they didn't speak up. Well, I mean, they did as they could, you know, keeping in mind that there were, there were a lot of other things that they were tending to. <laughs> so, yeah. I always go back to Fiddler on the Roof. Yeah. You know, it's, it's always there. He, as much as he wants to be the power, the women had the power. The women had the power. The women had the power. The women still have the power, particularly uh, at home. Although, you know, I think a lot of women, uh, I think about, you know, um, the next generation, my kids' generation, and there, there's so much that's so equal in terms of caretaking. Uh, of children and also of working. So it just, it, it doesn't get delineated in the same way that it did in the past. No, it's definitely changed. Yeah. So I've got a couple of just a, uh, someone named Susan Miller. Oh. Beautiful, funny, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh. Why am I crying, uh, Joy? <laughs> and Jeff Perry said that was simply <laughs> wonderful. Reading oh. brought me great joy, as does Joyla. Oh, so, thank you. Uh, we've got a couple of very nice uh, reports. That's sweet. Um, and I think that uh, Jen and Freda had uh, a couple of questions. Uh, 
Freda, Jen, can you guys come back in? There they Hi. are. Um, hello. hello. So um, I want to remind everybody, this is simulcast over Facebook Live and on the campus. So there are about 250 residents that live at the Motion Picture and Television Fund Retirement Community that have the opportunity to call in now on our live broadcast if you have questions as well. Um, I wanted to say um, I had a similar experience with my grandmother who for years would talk about how she was ready to die. And to, to know that that is more of a universal experience than what I thought uh, is very meaningful because I tried every way to say to her, each breath counts. Every <laughs> moment means something if you let it. And uh, yeah, that was really nice. So thank you. Thanks for documenting that. Um, we had a, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Fred. I, I was going to say we've got uh, a Q&A, but I know Freda had some questions as well. Sure, well go ahead, I'll keep it to one, which was, um, Joy, I know that Tessie boycotted your wedding to Brock. Right. Um, but then she also has uh, an unusual thought on marriage, which it likens it to an onion, which right. is unpleasant. Did her opinion change as the years went on? And did she then regret not coming to your wedding? I, you know what, she, it's a good question. Um, she did not regret it because it wasn't in keeping with her belief system, but she ended up referring to Brock as her lover boy. They became really good buddies. He, um, over time, was the sort of designated uh, person who would take Tessie back on the plane to New York when she came out to visit my folks in LA. And um, he, like my grandmother, is an amazing card player. So he, they, she loved playing gin with him, among other things. Um, but, you know, when she referred to the peeling of the onion in the marriage, I think that that had more to do with the fact that there's a lot of layers in an onion and you peel them and they make you cry and marriage um makes you cry i mean come on it's you've been married a long time it's a fabulous thing but you cry um amy spies oh amy spies amy spies sorry yeah asked, uh, what is it like for you re revisiting tessie and pearly now uh, it's you wonderful. You wrote this book, what, 20 years ago, right? I wrote this book 25 years ago, and I consider it like a, a huge gift to hear their voices again, to, during a pandemic, to invoke their wisdom again. Um, it's kind of great, actually. And I, so, um, I, I feel a little guilty, but I always feel guilty. So, you know, that's just my problem. Uh, and a former classmate of mine, and a good friend of yours, Laura Plotkin. Who is has, Laura? Hi, Laura, has chimed in. I was crying too, of course. Thanks to all of you. Now that I'm older, <clears throat> I really relate more to every word they said. Love this. Um, and, uh, I Thank you, LP. That was very sweet. Now, I want to ask uh, Kate and Jesse, how was it? Your actors, but you must have feelings inside both of you of your lives and how this reading of this affects you. Um, well, for, for me, um, I found this very emotional this time to read it. I think maybe there was something about reading it during the pandemic. I don't, we, we have not read it for 10 years. <laughs> We did this 10 years ago. Um, I feel like I'm getting closer to uh, Pearlie's age. I, I, I look forward to reading it at her real age. Joy, we're going to do that. <laughs> Stick around. Uh, yeah, but um, I also, I come from Brooklyn. Um, I am speaking from my mother and my grandmothers. Um, and um, I find all of this extremely emotional and I'm thrilled to be part of it. Kate? Well, um, I identified very much with an aunt that I had who's now no longer with us. And um, she was very pessimistic and she always saw the dark side of life. But 
but she was also very practical. And I find that my understanding of, you know, I connect with Tessie because I, I kind of feel like life is hard and then you die. And that's not a bad thing because that gives you some kind of foundation. Everything, everything else is good. You know, if you know it's going to be hard, then you're not wincing every time something difficult happens. And you kind of expect the worst. <laughs> and it could happen, it could not happen, but at least you're kind of expecting it and you're not disappointed. And I, I think that there's a, there's a modern equivalent of, 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 it, of it too. So um, I kind of get, I kind of get Tessie. Well, you're getting a lot of A reviews, uh, Joy. <laughs> we have one from Suki Amory. Oh. Yes, thank you all. That was a joy in these challenging days. Yeah, thank fun. you. From Norman Epstein, oi, I laughed and I cried. It truly brought Tessie and Pearlie back to life. <laughs> and Anne Rourke, I too am crying. You are such a wonderful writer, joyous. Uh, you are worthy of your subjects, which says a great deal. Mm. So uh, thank you. That's, uh, oh, and, and now and um, if the most important one is from Susan Miller. She says, applause to the actors. I have to take the doggy out. <laughs> Love you. But now we know it. We had, uh, I think we had something like uh, 56 participants just on the Zoom, not including anybody on Facebook. So uh, there were a lot of people listening and I'm sure enjoying. Uh, Jen, Freda, anything else that we Bob. can uh, Bob. talk about? Bob. Bob, oh, yeah. has something. Bob Beecher. Sorry. I, our CEO wants You're fired. to. You're I fired. apologize. You're fired. <laughs> I like your hat. Yeah, hey. me too. Me hey. too. First, I want to say hi to Joy. Hi, hi Bob. How are you? Good. Hi to Carol. I will. I think she may be on. Oh, good. Uh, listening. Uh, I just wanted to say, similar to uh, some of these other comments, I read the book 25 years ago, and it brought it back to me in such a sweet way. So I want to thank Jesse and Kate for their their contributions, and I know everyone on the campus loved it. It's such a wonderful, ad adoring uh, book and study of your grandmothers. So uh, thank you so much for sharing that with us. We need, in these days of pandemic and bad air quality and everything else, we need some light in our lives, and I think that's what what you all brought to us today. So thank you. And Hawk, as always, the best. Thank you. Well, uh, I'm, rehire I'm rehiring you now. <laughs> thank you very much. I'll send you my bill. <laughs> uh, please, please do. Send it by U.S. mail so I guarantee <laughs> ever to get it. <laughs> so there's a question from a woman named Molly Jordan Koch. Uh -huh. you might know. I'm oh, sorry, we're, we're not accepting any questions from, um, from that family. <laughs> she said, I cried too. I was so moved by the open and willing communication you had with your grandmothers. Did this level of communication exist between the grandfathers and you? Well, it should be mentioned that my grandpa Izzy, I was, I was named after him. He died the year before I was born. So his Hebrew name is my Hebrew name. Um, so I never got to meet my grandpa Izzy. And my grandpa Mo um, was um, deeply, uh, very much of an alcoholic, um, funny, wonderful, charming guy, but impossible to talk to. So no. And <laughs> he, he died, um, you know, um, many years. Well, he died right before my wedding. So he died many years before I, I embarked on this book project. So there was no way for me to really communicate with him in a way that I wanted to. But thanks for asking that question, Molly. Good question. Nancy, uh, Nancy Miller asked. Oh, Nancy. Hi, Nancy. Great to see you all again after all these years. Tears. Now that you are a grandma, what has changed about your understanding of what it meant to Tessie and Pearlie? Um, well, that's a very deep question. Uh, you know, it's the, it's a very primal thing being a grandparent. Uh, and I'm not going to, 
be saying anything that's new to anybody here who has grandchildren. Uh, there's nothing uh, for, in my life that is sort of more profound. So um, the idea that maybe one day my granddaughter might be interested in me to want to ask me questions about my life makes brings tears to my eyes. I mean, you know, it's a, it's just a, like a, uh, the continuity uh, of life uh, from one generation to the next is um, huge. So, yeah. I have a question. Go ahead, Jan. Um, which one was your favorite? <laughs> uh, well, hmm, that would probably, I would have to answer that based on food, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the metric for all Jews, right? Yeah, 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 right, exactly. Um, they were both incredible cooks. I mean, I, you know, this Friday is Rosh Hashanah, and I'm going to be making recipes from both of them. Although I have to say, I'm going to be getting my challah from Jesse's daughter's restaurant, Huckleberry, <laughs> because they make the most amazing challah. Yeah. But just a little throwing that out there. <laughs> which restaurant? Which restaurant would that be? Uh, Huckleberry. Yeah, Huckleberry. Huckleberry. Okay. In, in Santa Monica, but she's got a bunch of other restaurants too, which are equally amazing. Uh, there's a, there's a mention here from Malcolm Oral. Oh, hi, Malcolm. Yeah, lots of people. <laughs> I was deeply, deeply moved to relive the boundless beauty in these stories. And second time around, I was amazed how much of the original imagery was, was etched so powerfully in my psyche. Mm -hmm. so, so beautifully done by everyone. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Aloha Nui to all. Oh, you must have some, you must be in Hawaii somewhere. Mm. He no. grew up in Hawaii. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, thank you. And yeah. Thank you, Malcolm. We Let's see, we have. Uh, Steve Horowitz. I think I've heard of Horowitz. That's, That's a, my brother. Hi, Steve. Alive. <laughs> so, so, Joy, so proud of you. Really loved oh. it. Mary Rothman. Loved hearing your endearing book brought to life and wished I had your boobies wisdom now. Yeah. Are there things that you, there's a question. What do you use today uh, from, from your grandma's, what do you use with your grandchild today or with your children that you learned from these from these two wonderful ladies well you know in answer to jen's question about who was my favorite obviously pearly's attitude about uh putting your children on a pedestal is sort of more in line with how i uh hope to deal with my children and my grandchild than uh tessie who was she was tough she was really tough so um, I, does that sort of answer the question a little bit? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just wondering if, if when you're dealing with your, with, your, with your children or with your grandchild, yes. children, does something, as you're doing something, do you go, oh my God, that's what Tessie or Pearlie used to do. And I, I can use what I learned from them to to interact with my grandchild or with my children uh i think it has it, it has more to do with just you know beaming with you cavelling and feeling this incredible sense of pride in these little this little human you know uh it, it it's not rational it's just you know so in terms of what I, there are moments when i'm certainly with my children and my grandchildren or grandchild uh where i i hear my grandmother's voices that's that's what i was looking for absolutely yes 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 shame so, put them jan cherubin yay jan fantastic great, great writer. Entertaining. you said you wrote this book for your mother mm -hmm. i was wondering if you've written about your mother or if revisiting tessie and pearly sparks you to do that Oh, well, leave it to Jan to ask a very psychoanalytic kind of question. Uh, well, have I written about my mom? I want to write about my mom, uh, but I haven't uh, in any way that's uh, shareable yet. 
My mom yeah. was, she was, a, she was a fantastic person and she, you know, she was the daughter of an alcoholic. And so she was a big pleaser, my mother. And um, she, but she was also so loving and so generous. And um, so, and I think like a lot of children of alcoholics, she kind of would go out of her way to um, take care of other people before she would take care of herself. So mm -hmm. she was, she was the kind of person who I would say, mom, how are you? And she would say, well, your dad and your brother and your sisters, you know, but I would never hear about what, how mom actually was. Hmm. Laurel Benjamin. Oh, hi, Laurel. Essie used to cook for my family when we visited your parents' house in L.A. Right. She was an amazing cook. I had to eat so much. Uh, <laughs> and I, I want to promise from you that uh, hopefully next High Holy Days, not this year, but I want to come over and taste your marble cake next year. Because oh. <laughs> I, I understand the only place you can get Part of the recipe is uh, a market, the uh, Vincenti Foods. Is yeah, right? well, you know, you have to, it, it's based on the Duncan Hines box recipe, basically. Wow. And I don't know where else they sell it except for Vincenti Foods. They, they must sell it other places. But I just want to point out that my daughter, Lucy, refers to this cake when I make it as fat ass cake because it has so much sour cream in it. <laughs> but it's really good. <laughs> Norman Epstein asked, would you tell what Tessie used to say when people asked her age. Oh, right. She had this standard joke where um, you would say, Tessie, you know, how old are you? And Tessie would say, can you keep a secret? And you would say, yeah. And she would say, so can I. That was <laughs> Okay, well. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else, folks, or I think we could call it a day? Um, hang on, Hawk. I just want to uh, remind residents to please call in to Jen at the station because we're taking calls from residents as well. Okay, wait, we just got another. No, we, did, we didn't get there. We got one from Funny Movie. I've heard it before, but it's always fresh and relevant, so needed, especially now from Stephen. Uh, Nathan and Mary Rothman loved hearing your endearing book brought to life and wished I had your boobies wisdom now. And let me see. Thank you, you, Mary. If there's anything else. No, I don't have any others from this group, but uh, if anybody in the uh, home. Oh, Jen. So, um, I wanted to ask um, obviously, this book has been in print for a while. Where can people still get it? Um, and if we wanted to get a couple of copies here, maybe signed for game shows and things that we do for mm -hmm. our live broadcasts, um, how could we go about doing that? I, I actually have um, the large print edition, <laughs> which perfect. is really great for older people. But anyway, I'll, I'll make sure that you get a couple of copies. And you know, you can still get, I think the uh, paperback is available on Amazon. Um, and if not, you can contact me and I'll figure it out for you. I got it on Kindle. Oh, actually. Kindle, yeah. I was able to read it on Kindle. Okay. Yeah. Um, we I, also I, have- I, I buy the Joy's house. I pass it all the time and pick up the books if she wants to sign them. Perfect. Okay. Um, we have a bunch of photos that Joy had sent us that we didn't have a chance to share. So if oh, you yeah, want to prompt us a little bit, I'll, I'll go through the photos. Great sure. idea. Okay. Okay, put it, one up there, Jen. Put it up and I'll talk about it. How about that? Okay. Okay. So this is my, the little guy in the middle is my father. And this is uh, Tessie, as Jen pointed out, rocking her flapper look. And that's my grandpa, Izzy, um, who um, really looks so young there, my God. But my dad was born in 1923. So this must have been like, I don't know how old he is there, maybe a year or so. So somewhere around 24. It's a very metrosexual look. Metrosexual look for, for the little kid, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, <hilarious. laughs> 
And how about these fine ladies here? Oh, there they are. Okay, well, that's they're in the courtyard of my folks' house um, in Beverly Hills. And as you can see, you know, I described Pearlie wearing her crocheted um, talk with her little um, polyester pants. And Tessie has that sort of kind of critical look in her eye. Pearly, not so much. But, you know, I, the when they, they, they got along, they weren't crazy about each other, but they got along. All right, hold on one more second. Let me get you another one. These, all of these pictures are so good. Oh. Uh, let's, here, this is, this is a very, Oh, see, well, Wilfreda was asking about Pearlie or, or about Tessie and how she, whether she changed her attitude about boycotting our wedding. This is Pearlie uh, dancing with my husband Brock at our wedding. And um, she could not have been a more loving person, whether he was Jewish or not or whatever. She was just fabulous. And she really, really loved Brock. When there was a, the earthquake happened in 94, Brock ran over at five o'clock in the morning to make sure that she was okay. And she, she never forgot that. She always really valued that. Very so, strong. Mm. All right. And got a couple more here. Um, let's do, actually, let's do this one. This is oh. This is my dad on the left, uh, and Jerry, my mother's brother, who sadly died when he was only 50, having had a heart attack on the subway in New York City. But um, they met each other. The army had sent them to the University of Michigan to study Japanese, and became, my dad became a translator uh, right after the war. He went to, to um, Tokyo. Um, but it, remember I showed you, or Jen showed you the picture of my mom in the bathing suit looking like Lana Turner. Um, and that was what my dad responded to. I can't believe my dad is wearing a pinky ring in this photograph. I don't think I've ever noticed that before. I love details like that. That <laughs> don't strike you until years later. All right. So let's, um, let's do this one. Well, this is Tessie holding her first grandchild, my brother, Steve. Um, I think this must have, well, yeah, he was born, he and my sister Sherry were both, were both born in Topeka, Kansas. Um, so Tessie going from um, New York to Topeka to see her grandchild was, in those days, was a really big deal. And we've got a few more here. Um, should we show the pictures, show the picture of the kids with all wearing Tessie's crocheted outfits because they're so goofy. Okay. All that. So every kid, these are uh, Tessie's great grandchildren, although little Sammy sort of cut off on the right hand side, but see these crazy vests that they're wearing. Um, she with the smiley faces. Uh, she crocheted all of them and um, <laughs> they're kind of goofy. I love how they're all being bribed with lollipops too. Exactly, right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. And um, what, why don't we end with this one because yes. how can it be more perfect? Thank you. Well, you know, they were, they were the cover girls uh, in LA for one Sunday. And um, the, I, I should point out there was a, a photographer, I think his name is Andrew Eccles, who took these pictures. Uh, and he's just, he's amazing. And we use the same photos uh, in my book too. So um, they're so stylish. Aren't they? I know they were very stylish. Yes. Yeah. I also love how they're color coordinated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The pinky. Yeah. Well, thank you all again. Uh, I really appreciate everybody showing up uh, 
this has been a really, really fun time, heartfelt uh, and uh, so appreciated. And I hope all of, the, all of our residents and our Facebook friends uh, enjoyed themselves as well. So thanks, Bob and, and Freda and, and uh, certainly Miss, Miss Clymer, the best. And, and thank you, uh, thank you, Katie and, and, and Jesse and, and Joy. So, what a joy, what a joy, thank you. Thank you, thank Bye. you, it was really fun. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, -bye. Bye everybody, thanks thank Hart. You.